Today on the Bible Reading Challenge podcast, we are going to give an overview of the book of Romans. My name is Aaron Ventura, and I am joined today by Pastor Doug Wilson. He's the pastor of Christ Church, author of many books. He also helps start a K-12 school, a college, a denomination, and he blogs every week at, at DougWils.com. And I actually have with me a new, uh, I guess this is only an ebook format, but this is uh, a sermon notes on the book of Romans. So if uh, you want to go, go more in depth uh, with Romans, uh, I think you can get this. Uh, an ebook version of this on your blog, right? And then, are you guys working on getting hard copies on Amazon or something uh, like that? Yeah, well, yes. Uh, actually, Canon Press expressed an interest in picking it up as a commentary. Oh, okay. So that's in process. So we're going to get the full Canon Press edited <laughs> version of it. So Correct. it's called a Gospel for All Nations: Sermon Notes on the Book of Romans. And Pastor Doug, I had a question for you. You've written a lot of books. Uh, if you had to pick, like your three books that you're most proud of, or you're, you're happy with how they ended up, uh, what would those be? Okay, so um, I would say, that I'd wanna modify it. The, the books that I think that, the books that I've done that I think are uh, most crucial, one would be Reforming Marriage, okay. for example. Yeah. Um, I think that that is sort of a linchpin book that addresses a lot of the basics. So I'm very happy with the life that that book has had over the years. Yeah. So and that, when did you, do you remember when you wrote that? That would have been in the early 90s. Okay. So it's been around for a while uh, long, and people yeah. are still it's getting, still buying getting it. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of a perennial, um, uh, that, that's kind of a perennial. The book that I, I was um, happiest with, I think, with, with that was the most fun, yeah. was uh, probably Wordsmithy. Okay. I, uh, I enjoy writing and I enjoyed writing about writing and I, it just it was just a lot of fun yeah so um, uh, and then when uh, if it comes down to a book uh, what's the need of the hour mm-hmm. yeah, kind of book um, I would say it'd be a toss-up between rules for reformers and serrated edge okay have you thought about doing like an updated serrated edge version I, I, you know, when I look at stuff I did years ago, I always think, man, <laughs> that needs to be cleaned up. <laughs> you know, it, because you you learn things, you have new examples. And, yeah. and um, so I, I don't know that uh, it's in a high priority, but I think that Serrated Edge could use a, 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 revise, a revision. Yeah, a, a whole chapter on Facebook comments and yeah. Twitter threads <laughs> yes. probably could, and, could yeah, be added there. YouTube, YouTube, uh, uh, YouTube comment sections. Yeah, and then uh, okay, bo- bonus one of the kind of fiction books you've uh, you've written. What would your favorite of those be? Hmm. Or well, one that is coming out possibly. <laughs> yeah, the, the, my favorite would be the one that is that's going to be coming out in a few weeks called okay. R- Ride Sally Ride. Okay, I, yeah, tell us a little uh, bit about this book. <laughs> okay, so that book is um, a dystopic, dark comedy about the crack up of the United States thirty years in the future. Okay, and. Uh, and some people have looked at it and said, what do you mean 30 years? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> this <laughs> already happened. You know? <laughs> yeah, this is more like three months. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that's uh, Ride Sally Ride is basically about uh, a red state, blue state divide. The United States is hanging by a thread. And a young man, young Christian man, in a Phineas moment, uh, compacts a sex android that his next door neighbor identified as his wife mm-hmm. and a woke prosecutor charges him with first degree murder <laughs> because the android was identified as a person yeah um and that's the setup for the okay for the novel see like, the, it seems like what you're doing is taking like van till and greg bonson's push the antithesis and you're putting that in a story form so yes, that's right <laughs> Epistemo- van till epistemological self-consciousness yeah and that's what that's what that novel is uh, illustrating. Yes. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to, to reading that. Well, uh, today we're going to be talking about Romans, and um, I have just you here today because right. I thought you probably preached through this book how many times? I've, I've preached through it verse by verse twice, okay. and and then uh, I've done different sermons out of different parts of Romans on, on other occasions. Yeah, so if you kind of survey what uh, the church has said about this book, whether that's Luther or Calvin or Augustine or, or John Piper, he calls it, you know, the greatest letter ever written. I think he spent like seven years uh, <laughs> preaching through, through, through Romans in, in, in John Piper fashion. Can you talk a little bit about why is Romans such a big deal? 
I think it is. Uh, I think it is very definitely the Apostle Paul's magnum opus, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you want a little microcosm of it, that's Galatians. Yeah. You know, Galatians is very early. All you know, essential things are there, and but and it's written, but that's written in the heat of controversy. Yeah. Right, and it's early. Uh, the Book of Romans is his um, thought out, measured. Here it is. Here it is. This is what I'm leaving to the world. Yeah. And uh, and it's very uh, thoughtful and intentional. Um, if you if you look at the occasion of the of the letter. It's a fundraising letter, basically. Uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul wants to go to Spain. Mm-hmm. He was very careful not to s- trespass on other people's ministries. Yeah. He didn't plant the church at Rome, so he's v- being very cautious about how he approaches them. But he wants the Roman church to help him financially with the trip to Spain. Yeah. And uh, his uh, approach to fundraising letters is very different than the 21st century approach. <laughs> no pictures. <laughs> no, no pictures. And, and, and what he does is he lays out, this is what I believe, this is what I preach everywhere. Okay. And this is what I would preach in Spain if you help me get there. Here's the, this is the gospel. And he uh, leaves no stone unturned. He just uh, methodically works through the whole thing. Yeah. And, um, and I think that it's a, uh, a great place to go to get, um, the Apostle Paul's Summa. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how it affected your own theological journey and even uh, the church now? Uh, mm-hmm. It's called Christ Church. Once upon a time, it, it wasn't. Right. Uh, how did Romans affect your own theological journey and then the church now being where it is? Yeah, I was um, in a discombobulated state theologically. Uh, and for this was back in 1988. Okay. And Some people I, think you still are, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. But what, but what do they know? <laughs> um, so I was um, I was sorting through a bunch of all these things, a, a bunch of these issues, and I decided for some reason that I was going to preach through the Book of Romans mm-hmm. in 1988. And I remember telling one of the elders, uh, "I don't know what I'm going to say when I get to those chapters." And that's how I referred to those chapters, yeah. which would be 8, 9, 10, and 11. I didn't know what I was going to say when I got there. And, um, and I remember, uh, basically, uh, it was very clear. I don't remember the exact words, but I remember the tone of it. And this is not recommend. I don't recommend it. This is <laughs> it's just what happened. But I, I got to a place, I may have been chapter 9, um, but I got to a certain hard nugget yeah. like what I'm gonna what am I gonna say and it was in the Paul I was preaching when I was doing this and I thought something like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Jacob I love he saw I hate it okay <laughs> I, I, I'll just say what it says yeah I'll just say what it says and I did and and then I was still uh, muddled enough that I I um I'd spent two years after that point. Well, I, I sort of ran up the Jolly Roger at that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm preaching what the Romans actually says. But I spent two years after that denying that I was a Calvinist mm-hmm. because I didn't learn it from Calvin. I learned it from Paul. I learned, you know. Yeah. And but then after two years of that, I realized that all I was doing, I wasn't convincing anybody that I was not a partisan. Mm-hmm. I was just convincing them that I was being dishonest. Because they were in denial. Yeah, I was in (laughs) denial, and they were saying, "Look, we know what a Calvinist is, and you're one of them." Yeah, right. And so, okay, uh, I I don't want to ever fall into the trap of I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. I didn't want to do that. That's what I was trying to avoid. But as a form of shorthand, um, and not a partisan flag to wave. Yeah, I think it's a fair representation. The Apostle Paul laid it out in Scripture. The great Augustine spread it into certain corners, yeah. and John Calvin spread it into more corners and mm-hmm. and systematized it, um, uh, pursued the implications. And I, but I think it's all there in Romans. Yeah, you've talked to, uh, in the past. I've heard you talk about becoming a Calvinist <clears throat> as being epistemologically, uh, I don't know, humiliating or hum- or humbling. Yes. And it seems like when when someone does become reformed or they're just reading scripture and they're they have that point where they're going to say, all right. I'm just going to say what the text says, or if you're not a preacher, I'm just going to embrace mm-hmm. and not kick against right. what the text says. Can you talk about how that affects your whole hermeneutic and um, kind of understanding of the rest of Scripture when you tap out and say, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think one of the essential things um, that 
preachers particularly, but all Christians should have, is to have an a priori commitment that once the exegesis is done, they will have no problems with the text. Whatever it teaches, that's what I'm, a, I'm going to embrace. Yeah. And that was the humiliating part for me at, um, pr prior to that time in the pulpit, uh, was when I admitted, uh, and, and this is awfully big of me, I know, <laughs> I, told God, I told God that I was willing for this to be true. Um, before that time, I wasn't. Okay. You know, before that, I just simply was not. And when I it finally said, okay, I'm willing for this to be true, I didn't believe that it was true, mm -hmm. but I had surrendered the, I would quit grasping, yeah. right? So I was willing to be instructed by the Word. And, and Christians who are not willing to be instructed by the Word are just going to have a tough time of it. Yeah. Especially in these... Um, tumultuous times of ours where the the secular world is demanding that we be embarrassed by lots of scripture right. uh, demanding that we be embarrassed about uh, what the bible teaches about um, sex and gender embarrassed by what the bible teaches about the different uh, tribes of men uh, ethnic divisions among men embarrassed by what the bible teaches about property you know yeah. there are all sorts of Places you can, they can make you climb down off of, yeah. if you are prepared to be embarrassed by the Bible. Yeah, and I think the learning the lesson of not being embarrassed by anything, just going in. I, yeah. I, if I, if I do the exegesis and I'm confident that this is what Paul in fact said, right. then I'm going to say that too. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone who's bumping up against these kind of angular texts, and maybe they don't even know what the word exegesis means, right. but there, something is, okay, they want to take seriously the word of God. How do you help someone not just submit to it, gritting their teeth, but to actually love it, right. like it, and yeah, be yeah. like, I, del I actually delight in this? Yeah, first... A definite, good definition of exegesis would be exegesis is when you're unpacking the suitcase. Uh, eisegesis means that you're packing the suitcase. <laughs> you're, the, and the suitcase is the Bible. Uh, so eiseg an eisegete is someone who tries to make the Bible say what he would like it to have said. Yeah. Um, exegesis is where you open the suitcase and find out what God packed for you. Mm -hmm. And you only take out of the suitcase, what God packed in there. Yeah. Uh, so that's what ex that's what exegesis uh, is, and and so when you um, when you resolve to, and the, your question has to do with um, not just making the decision to accept it and grumbling, mm -hmm. yeah. but to embrace it with the whole heart. Um, I love the law, the psalmist says. Yeah. So, so uh, we are to treasure the sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. So I need to, I'm not really accepting it mm -hmm. unless I taste it as good. Yeah. So um, Peter says, as newborn infants sincerely desire the milk of the word, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Mm -hmm. So the word is a good thing, and we uh, newborn Christians instinctively seek out food, but then... When they get the food, they enjoy it. It's if it, and if you're not enjoying it, then something's wrong. Yeah, it seems like there's also these pictures and warnings were given of someone who's tasted the goodness of the word. I believe in in Hebrews, mm -hmm. and then returns to their old ways, and it's described right. as you know a dog returning to its vomit. And you think, if you don't love God's word, you right. love vomit. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's it's one. It's got to be one or the other. It's going to break. There's only two ultimate destinations for human beings and that's with God or away from God yeah the, and those are the two destinations and everything that we do is going to be taking another step toward one of those two destinations right so uh, Romans is 16 chapters longest right. letter that Paul wrote uh, when and where do you place the writing of this uh, letter um, so um, Paul is um, uh, I'd have to look that up. Fifties. Yeah, uh, I think you in, say in here. I think you have it at fifty-seven yeah. um, on his third missionary journey. Right, um, and he is preparing for uh, a missionary journey to Spain, mm -hmm. which he references. Yeah, and and we don't have any record in Acts or anywhere else in Scripture of him actually making it to Spain. Yeah, but when you look at how he is um, expecting, we have probably two imprisonments mm -hmm. by of Paul. One is at the end of the book of Acts. Right. And uh, I, I believe Clement, uh, well, 
uh, Clement wrote a letter to the Corinthians, the, to the Corinthian church, and Clement was a friend of Paul's, and this is a uh, late first century um, letter. Yeah. Uh, and so Clement of Rome, who's a friend of Paul's, says that Paul made it to Spain, and he he actually uses the phrase the westernmost part of the uh, empire, mm -hmm. which would have been Britain. Yeah. So um, some people think that Paul made it as far as Britain, uh, but I think he made it to Spain, and that that trip would have been placed between the the he's released from his house arrest at yeah. the end of the Book of Acts. He goes um, um, he goes and and preaches in Spain. At some point subsequent to that, he's rearrested, and in the mid '60s is um, beheaded, according to early tradition, which is generally received as reliable. Yeah, uh, and. So in the pastoral epistles, which are that's when he's in prison, it's it's a very different kind of imprisonment yeah. that you see at the end of Acts. Then the cozy yeah. house arrest where right. they're taking the house arrest. He's got freedom to preach and that yeah. sort of thing. In the pastoral, he's I've run the good race. I've uh, yeah. I've fought the fight. I've I'm ready to be poured out like a drink offering. So yeah. so I think the basic chronology is um, Paul is arrested, released at the end of Acts, he's released, he goes to Spain, maybe Britain, preaches there, comes back, is rearrested, mm -hmm. and then ends his life in the mid-60s. Okay. And how would you uh, maybe outline this book if you were to say, all right, what's a way of tackling 16 chapters in bite-sized portions? Do you have any kind of literary structure or overview that you would outline this, this uh, book with? Yeah. Uh, so I would say that I, I said earlier that he's setting, laying out his gospel, mm -hmm. uh, laying the gospel out. And uh, so uh, he does that. He The gospel proper is set out by him in chapters one through five. So, uh, and then, so here's, the, here's a rough and ready. One through five is his statement of the gospel. This is it, guys. Mm -hmm. And then six on is the Q&A section. Okay. <laughs> All right, so one through five is his presentation. Yeah. And then he begins the section of Romans, one of you will say to me then. So Paul has been in a lot of these Q&A sessions in a lot of synagogues, Yeah. right? So chapter one, the Gentiles are a mess. The Gentiles are under sin. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2, the Jews are a mess also. Chapter 3, they're both the same kind of mess. <laughs> Jews and Gentiles all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody's a mess. Yeah. So uh, Gentiles are under sin. The pagan world is corrupt. The Jewish world is orthodox but corrupt. Mm -hmm. Uh, they do the same things that the pagans do. The, uh, the third chapter, they're all corrupt together. The human race is a mess. The covenant people of God are a mess, and the people who are out of covenant with God are a mess. So that's the problem mm -hmm. that has to be solved, chapters 1 through 3. And then chapter four, chapters 4 and 5 are two different statements of the gospel. Um, the chapter 4 is sort of an exegetically based, scripture-driven description of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Abraham, in yeah. the book of Genesis, um, believing God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then chapter 5 is more of a theological, typological uh, Adam, the first yeah. Adam and the, and the second Adam. Um, so he's, he gives us a statement of, of um, justification by faith, mm -hmm. exegetically derived in chapter 4, and justification by faith um, uh, theologically derived in yeah. chapter 5. So that that is problem and solution, bad news, good news. Mm -hmm. And then, he says, so we're justified by faith apart from works of the law. And that's the message. So the first question is, if we're justified by grace through faith apart from works of the law, then won't that lead to moral disorder, if you, if you accept that? Yeah. Uh, what should we say then? Shall we sin that grace may abound? So that's where he begins answering objections. Mm -hmm. In a classical oration, that'd be the refutatio, okay. where he's anticipating um, what people will throw at him, and yeah. he says, so um, won't this, in, won't salvation by grace encourage people to sin up a storm because they're forgiven for everything? Um, and one of the things that, that is very helpful about the Q&A mm -hmm. section of Romans is to measure how the things that you say to your next door neighbor who's a Mormon, does it have a tendency to um, provoke the same objections, mm -hmm. right? 
So if you say, well, we're saved by grace apart from works of the law, and your Mormon neighbor says, but won't people sit up a storm? Yeah, if, drinking soda uh, and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> yeah, who knows what's going to happen. Um, uh, the, the, when you're provoking the same objection, perhaps it's because you're saying the same thing that mm-hmm. Paul was saying. Yeah. Um, so chapter 6 is, uh, won't people abuse this offer of grace? Won't people abuse grace? Yeah. Um, chapter 7 is, well, if we're justified by faith, by grace through faith, apart from works of the law, then what was the law for then? Yeah. Uh, why, did, why is so much of the Old Testament devoted to the law? What's the purpose of the law? Mm-hmm. And chapter 7 describes how the law is given to work us over and make us aware of our need for grace, yeah. which you have anticipations. You've got anticipations of what chapter 7 does in Romans 3.20 and Romans 5.20. Mm-hmm. So the law is given in order to stir sin up, to make us aware of our need for grace. Um, the law binds us, uh, makes us slaves, so that we may be liberated. Mm-hmm. So uh, in chapter 7, I think Paul is talking about his, um, um, his experience as a Pharisaical Christian that who was representative of the condition of Israel as a whole. Pharisaical Jew? or Fa- a Phari- I'm sorry, Pharisaic- I said Christian. Pharisaical Jew. Uh, so I think chapter 7, and this is a perennially debated thing among evangelicals, right. is chapter 7 talking about the Christian experience or the non-Christian experience. Yeah. I think, uh, well, how about a third option? Uh, the Jewish experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, Reformed believers generally take chapter 7 as a description of the Christian's internal struggle. Um, And I I have an exegetical difference with them on that, but not a theological difference. So so what most uh, Reformed people think is happening in chapter 7, I think really is happening in Galatians 5. The flesh wars against the spirit. Yeah. So I think there is an internal battle. Yeah. But I don't think that that's what chapter 7 is about. Okay. Chapter 7 is about uh, the the Jews who had the law, who knew what God's teaching was, but had no power to live up to it. Yeah, and you would want to situate Romans seven in the logical flow of the whole book argument to say it would be out of place if suddenly he's just talking about his oh, and I'm really struggling personally right, with right. with the flesh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. I think he's answering. He's still answering questions. Okay. What's the what's the law um, for? And then in chapter 8, he moves into a positive statement of the, the law. Uh, the, the, after the law has beat you up yeah. in Romans 7, uh, the law of the spirit of life. Life has set me free from the law of sin and death. Yeah. And there's a positive description of the law in chapter 8. Yep. Um, then at, at chapter 8 ends with this glorious crescendo of... Um, who, who will lay a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies uh, neither height, depth, breadth, nothing. Yeah. N- nothing in the present, nothing in the future can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, then, the problem is that he used that word elect. I said, what, who can separate us from, uh, uh, what can separate the elect from the love of God? And he says, nothing. Well, then the next obvious objection is, well, Paul if nothing can separate the elect from the love of God, why are God's elect, the Jews, chasing you around the Mediterranean trying to kill you? Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a big hole in the argument here. It's a huge hole in the argument, and that's what chapter 9 is about. He says, uh, I'm using elect in two different senses. Mm-hmm. All right, The Jews are the elect covenant people of God, but not all Israel are Israel. Yeah. There's an elect within yeah, the elect. Right. Okay, so, um, not all Christians are Christians. Right. Yeah. Uh, not all husbands are husbands. Not not all Americans are Americans. <laughs> uh, so there are people who have the whatever the bound boundary of the covenant is. Yeah. There are people who are faithful to that covenant, and there are people who, who are technically members of it, mm-hmm. but who are unfaithful right. to it. Uh, so <clears throat> in chapter nine, he is uh, he's arguing that. Uh, not all Israel are Israel. So the the Israel that's chasing me around the Mediterranean, they're not real. They're not truly Israel. Yeah. They've been, uh, and then he moves into chapter ten and chapter eleven, showing that they've been cut out of the olive tree. Yeah. Uh, these people are fruitless branches. They were cut out because of unbelief, and he warns 
uh, and he then warns the Roman Christians who were remember, and this is something that people often forget, he warns the Roman Christians that they are not to become haughty like the Jews did, mm -hmm. uh, but rather they're to fear because they were Christians in the capital city of a huge empire. Uh, so there's a, it's it's like um, if you've got a little community chapel out in the country somewhere where the 15 people attend on a Sunday morning, and you're the past or compared to the pastor of a church in Washington D.C. where the president might show up on a Sunday, or yeah. and senators teach Sunday school, and yeah. the, the, Trump says he's going to live stream your <laughs> worship service, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. And that happened to uh, evangelical church where yeah. you know. Trump just showed up at the service. Well, that affects your, that could easily affect your perception of your importance as a church. Right. When the most important people in the world are coming to it. Yeah. Well, Paul's, Paul was already seeing signs of trouble mm -hmm. in Rome. Yeah. And he warns them in chapter 11 in very striking terms. He warns them not to be haughty with fear. That's the thing that tripped the Jews up. Mm -hmm. Don't you, you don't support the root, the root supports you. The Jews were cut out because of unbelief. You stand by faith. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Yeah. And, and it's quite striking that uh, chapter 11 is in, think of it this way. The Roman Catholic Church, situated in Rome, has a letter written to them by the Apostle Paul telling them to guard themselves against certain forms of hubris, yeah. <laughs> which they didn't do. <laughs> you know, they, um, we, the, and they say, in effect, the Roman Catholic doctrine is that they are the root. And, but Paul says, no, if the Jews could be cut out after over a thousand years, yeah. right, what makes you think that you can <clears throat> deny the gospel? Yeah. And, uh, and it's quite striking that the great collision with Rome mm -hmm. in the in the Reformation in the 16th century revolved around the Book of Romans. Yeah, that, that's um, uh, it's quite uh, quite striking. And then in chapter 12, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, uh, Paul moves into um, nuts and bolts instructions for Christians yeah. on how, uh, how they're supposed to conduct themselves. Um, as believers in Romans chapter twelve, how do you how do you um, oversee the spiritual gifts that God has given to the church? How do you, how do you exercise mm -hmm. your gifts in chapter thirteen? How do you interact with the existing authorities in chapter fourteen? How do you handle disputes about um, adiaphora things in different um, dietary issues and uh, one man's. Uh, honors a, a certain holiday and another man doesn't. How do you navigate those? Um, and then in chapter 15, Paul is coming to the the point of his Gentile world mission, why he wants to go to Spain. Yeah. And then chapter 16 would be his final greetings and um, uh, his how he signs off. Yeah. That's great. So let's uh, kind of backtrack and just hit a few highlights here. So uh, Romans chapter 1 is a lot about the sinfulness of sin. We get this yeah. long list of sin. And we also have uh, some fascinating stuff about the knowledge of God. Right. Uh, can you talk about uh, Romans 1 and its importance as maybe a evangelist or a preacher in terms of understanding what the unbeliever knows to be true and mm -hmm. what they also are suppressing? Yeah, very good. They're <laughs> suppressing their knowledge of God. It, Paul, Paul says very plainly in the first chapter that every person has a knowledge of God and so that no one has an, uh, no one has a legitimate excuse at the last day yeah. when everybody stands before God everyone will, every mouth will be stopped everyone will know that God is righteous in his judgments mm -hmm. and so for an evangelist uh, uh, someone preaching the gospel for a personal evangelist whether he's preaching to a crowd or talking to a person one on one he has to believe what Romans 1 says about that unbeliever as opposed to what that unbeliever is saying about that unbeliever. Yeah. So the person might say, oh, I have no awareness of God at all. I have no, I'm an atheist. I, I, I just, I find no argument compelling. Well, Romans 1 says that he knows, that you, you know, speaking to him, that when you say there is a God and I'm, com I'm in fellowship with him now, mm -hmm. and I'm presenting the gospel that he's given to me to give to you, yeah. you know before, without any indication from that person that what you're saying resonates at some level of his being as true. Yeah. So uh, he knows somewhere, somehow, 
that you're speaking the truth. That doesn't mean that it, that's necessarily front and center in his conscious mind, mm -hmm. but it's affecting him some way that oftentimes in ways he doesn't like. Yeah. Or, I, I don't like this feeling I have when I talk to this Christian. Well, why? You know, you wouldn't mind talking to someone who believed in the Easter Bunny, right? right? Uh, well, maybe you would. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you would mind. But the the creepy feeling or the feeling of distaste, the the way that Edmund felt in the line the Witch in the Wardrobe when he first heard the name of Aslan, mm -hmm. there's something that resonates. There's yeah. it's we're uh, we're all like tuning forks, and when a certain note is struck in our presence, yeah. that tuning fork vibrates yeah and there's nothing we can do to stop it yeah and that's why a, a, an effective an effective evangelist is someone who simply speaks to the condition that the bible says the person's in mm -hmm. rather than the condition that that person tells you he's in um if um if you were to, not that you would want to be a mugger, but if you walked up to behind someone and stuck a pistol in the small of the back and said, give me your wallet, and the person laughed and said, well, you can't do that because I don't believe in guns. <laughs> if you got turned red and put your gun away, say, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize you didn't believe in guns. Uh, the problem is not that he doesn't believe in guns. The problem is that you don't believe in guns. Yeah. Right, The Christian who puts his Bible away, the Christian who puts the gospel away, mm -hmm. is someone who is embarrassed by what Paul says in Romans 1. Everybody knows this. Yeah. There's also this logical connection he makes between ingratitude and then all sorts of sexual perversions, homosexuality and, and mm -hmm. so forth. Can you, uh, that to some people might seem like, how's he getting there? Can you yeah. uh, kind of fill in the gaps of Yeah, there's two things. There? There's, there's two things and, uh, that he mentions in Romans 1. They, they did not honor God as God and did not give him thanks. Mm -hmm. Those are the two characteristics. They don't want to acknowledge the sovereignty of God, and they don't want to be grateful to a sovereign God who gave them everything they have. Yeah. Well, if you're not grateful to God for everything he gave you, then that's going to spill over into a general ingratitude toward the universe. <laughs> right? I, I don't want to honor God as God. I don't want to give him thanks because there's stuff I don't have that I still want. Well, the name for that is lust. Right. Yeah. So an ungrateful person, an ungrateful person, is a person who always wants more or better mm -hmm. or different, right? And because we're sexual beings, that naturally the thing that you want, you know, uh, there are immediate needs that you have, like breathing or food or water. Yeah. But beyond that, a far more powerful <laughs> desire that everybody has mm -hmm. is a desire for sexual. Uh, contact, intercourse, communion, what, and if you've refused to honor God, the sovereignty of God who invented it, yeah. and you refu refuse to give him thanks for that, then you're naturally going to give way to, um, I, I want that woman and that woman and that woman, and, and then that doesn't satisfy. I'm still ungrateful. Yeah. Right. I'm still ungrateful. And so that's how perversions are born. Mm -hmm. I, I want, I, I want something more. I demand something more. Yeah. Uh, the, the book of Romans is book ended, uh, with the, this phrase, uh, the obedience of faith. So Paul wants yeah. to bring about the obedience of faith and then he ends it. What is the obedience of faith? Um, God commands all men everywhere to repent and believe the gospel. So when I, Repent, and when I believe the gospel, I'm obeying. I'm do, I'm doing what I was told. Yeah. Right. Now, um, faith, and this is uh, there are a, <laughs> there are a number of things. Christ modeled the obedience of faith um, for us. Right. He um, and he, up to and including, I would say, repentance. Mm -hmm. uh, he was baptized by John the Baptist with the baptism of repentance. Right. So. Um, as C.S. Lewis points out in Mere Christianity, Jesus was perfect. Uh, and so, um, contrary to what Don Lemon thinks, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it was Don Lemon. <laughs> yeah. um, Jesus was perfect, and he never, so he was the only one who did, never needed to repent. But being perfect, he was the only one who could repent with perfect humility. And pre he, he's the only one who could repent perfectly, and therefore the only one who didn't need to. Yeah. Uh, and what he did was he did did what needed to be done on our behalf. Mm -hmm. So when Christ repented and trusted God throughout the course of his life, this was Israel living 
living before God the way Israel ought to have done. Mm -hmm. And that obedience, what theologians call the act of obedience of Christ, is imputed to us, Mm -hmm. which is a big part of the book of uh, Romans. And then his sacrifice of himself on the cross, which theologians call the passive obedience of Christ, is also imputed to us. So because I'm a sinner, I need, I I owe God blood. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a sinner, I owe God blood. And God imputes to me the the gift of blood that Christ shed on the cross. Yeah. But I, I owe God more than blood for my disobedience. Mm-hmm. I owe him obedience instead of the disobedience. Right. Right? So um, Christ pays that also. So uh, that's, the, that's the obedience of faith that's modeled by Christ. Mm-hmm. And then when I look at that total package and I respond in repentance and faith, that I'm following him with the obedience of faith. Yeah, the body should be doing what the head Correct. has shown them how to do. Correct. Uh, so you, you mentioned this word imputed. Can you talk about uh, Romans 5 and imputation? And this would be one of the battlegrounds for our discussion about uh, kind of total depravity or we're, we're born in sin and the idea of federal headship, right. Adam and Christ. Some people would want to deny that sin is imputed to us from Adam. And we would just say, well, why do babies die? You know, why, why does anyone die? What is imputation? How does Romans 5 um, speak to that? Imputation is a reckoning or a declaration. So the best way to think of it, it's a forensic term, uh, first century forensic term, legal term. Yeah. Uh, and so I've, I served as a, on a jury once in a murder trial, actually. And when we came in the courtroom, uh, the, we found the, the defendant guilty. But before we came in and before the verdict was read, he was personally guilty in that he had committed the murder, but he was legally innocent. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when when the jury came in and we the verdict was read, then his legal status changed. Right. That was a performative act. Yeah. So when the the clerk reads the jury finds him guilty, it wasn't like guilt rays zapped across <laughs> the courtroom, but it's it's a performative act like. Uh, a minister declares uh, in a wedding, mm-hmm. right? I now announce that you're husband and wife. Before that declaration is made, he no touch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Afterwards, he must. Yeah. Right? Or uh, before the man puts his hand on the Bible and raises his right hand and takes the oath of office, mm-hmm. we don't let him anywhere near the nuclear football. Right. Right? <laughs> Afterwards, because of these words, yeah, it, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, uh, we, we because we said these words, he is invested with that office. All yeah. of those are acts of imputation. Yeah, and so uh, what happens when a person is justified? When an individual repents and believes, God uses that faith, the faith that they have um, placed in Christ, because they've heard the gospel. God uses that faith as the instrument Mm -hmm. by which he imputes the righteousness of Christ to them. So um, there's there's basically three imputations, three great imputations in Scripture. One is the imputation of Adam's sin to all his posterity. Mm -hmm. Um, So Adam Adam represented us in the garden, and so his sin is imputed to us then our sin is imputed to Christ mm-hmm. on the cross, and Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. Yeah. So those are the three great imputations. And if someone said, well, I don't believe in all that imputation, then say, so why do you sin? Uh, why, why, are, why is the human race mm-hmm. given over to sin? What, yeah. What's the basis of that? And how does Christ's death on the cross 2,000 years ago yeah. do anything for you? Yeah. Right? So yeah, so if you deny the imputation of sin, you have to logically deny the imputation of righteousness. And so that's why you don't want to do that. <laughs> Got to accept the bad news if, if you want the good right, news. Exactly. Um, let's jump ahead to, to Romans chapter 11. And uh, this is another kind of debated text even uh, between the Reformed about the future of Israel. Yes. Uh, can you talk about uh, maybe what some of the views are and then why you take the view that you do? Okay, you're, you're talking about the uh, cutting away of the Jews and the inclusion yeah. of... Yeah, are we expecting the Jewish uh, state to somehow all become Christian one day? Are they the same Jews that were, that Paul is talking about yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
So uh, this is a, an, an enormous uh, subject, but uh, there are two basic views in the reform world. And w one is that we can look forward to a time when the, the Jews, the people, the rabbis and synagogues, yeah. um, are converted to Christ mm -hmm. and they come back to Christ and are grafted back into the um, olive tree. Uh, and that's, that's my view. Uh, and then the other view is that that prediction that Paul made was largely fulfilled in the first, in the first century. In the first century. Yeah. So um, the, the Jews today don't have any special status in uh, in God's reckoning or in God's economy at yeah. all, according to that view, mm -hmm. um, and I I take um, there's a verse in Zechariah I think it's Zechariah 12 that um, how big was the remnant? So the doctrine of the remnant is yeah. an important doctrine in Romans in chapter 10, mm -hmm. and so the question is how big was the remnant and what was the status of the non-remnant, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and how long does that status last? Right. Right. So I, I, I believe that there were some people th take the remnant as referring to one half of one percent of, of the Jews of the first century. I think that that's way underestimating. I, I believe that a, a, approximately a third of the Jewish nation in the first century believed and became Christians mm -hmm. and were assimilated into the Christian church. Yeah. Ju okay. uh, jumping ahead to Revelation, which we're going to do a, a whole show on, would you see the 144,000 as potentially though that all Israel that's coming in, or is that something separate? Okay, so I take, um, I take the 144,000 as being representative of all the elect of God. Jew and Gentile together. Oh, okay. All right, but I think that there's you could make an argument that it was the, the hundred. They were twelve thousand from every tribe, and right. someone could argue that no, this is the remnant. Okay. Right. Um, but I take it as the the whole body of God's elect. So when if about a third of the Jews all through the New Testament, the the Pharisee, the leaders of the Jews were reluctant to um, arrest Jesus because they were afraid of the people. Um, the, uh, there are many indications that Jesus and the apostles in Israel were very were significantly popular. Yeah. Right? They, there are a lot of people paid attention and respect, and all of Judea went out to yeah. be baptized by John the Baptist and so on. So I think, we're, I think there were an, an enormous number of Jews who believed. But Paul says... He identifies them as a remnant. I think the Jewish leadership did not believe, and the bulk of them. So I think roughly a third, two thirds is the breakdown. Um, and then, then the question is, what? How do we? How long? Yeah. Did that expire in seventy, or did it go on for? Does it go for longer? on? And Paul says in chapter eleven that the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that I take that as extending okay. beyond. One century. Okay. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable, and and then you have to factor uh, factor in the odd circumstance of the Jews still being here. Yeah. Right. We don't have any Hittites. We don't have any Moabites. We don't have any. Why are the Jews so plentiful? Why are they still around? Why do they still have this identity? Yeah. And some people say, well, uh, what we think of is he is not really Hebrew, like King David Hebrew. It's more like Eastern European Yiddish. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, they're thinking of Ash uh, Ashkenazi Jews, and, and yeah. they were converted in the 1300s or whatever it was. But that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter mm -hmm. in biblical terms, because what matters in biblical terms is the covenant. Yeah. So, um, uh, so Abraham, for example, when Abraham was circumcised, he's the father of the Jewish people. Uh, when he goes to war, he he muster, he's able to muster an army yeah. of 300, over uh, 380 yeah. something, uh, 300 northwards fighting men. Yeah. So Abraham has a small army. When Abraham was circumcised, it was he and his whole household were circumcised. Yeah. Which tells us that some someone could trace their ancestry as a Jew mm -hmm. back to the generation of Abraham. And most of them wouldn't have a trace of Abraham's blood in their veins. Yeah. Right. It was covenant. Yeah. Right. It was it was covenant. It so it's never 
it's never been blood. It's always been covenant. Yeah. So if the Ashkenazis um, converted to Judaism in the 1300s and mm -hmm. have lived like Jews ever, ever since, yeah. I think they're Jews. I think they're Jews, and I think they're cut out of the olive branch, mm -hmm. uh, out of the olive tree, and God promises that they'll be grafted back in again. So uh, with the Puritans, I, I take that as sort of the linchpin of future world mission. Okay. If, if their cutting away was blessing for the Gentiles, yeah. what will their re-inclusion be but life from the dead? Yeah, I forget if it's in the Westminster larger catechism when it's talking about maybe going through the Lord's prayers, like what do we pray? And the, the prayer that the Jews would come in, I think, is even in uh, yeah. Westminster yeah. standards. All right, we're going to finish with chapter 13 because it is just a really important <laughs> yes. chapter in this in these times. moment. So uh, what do we do with Romans 13? <laughs> we obey it. We, we believe <laughs> and we it. And we love it. <laughs> we love it. We believe it. We accept it. We obey it. Uh, but we have to understand it. Or we ha we can't just um, say, oh, Romans 13. Um, we have to exegete. We have to exegete passage. it first. Yeah. And um, one of the things that, uh, the, the probably the most striking thing about Romans 13 is that God says, uh, Paul says, God says through Paul, uh, two or three times in that passage, he says that the established authorities that God has established, so the question would be, God established them as what? Uh -huh. Well, he established them as his diakonos, uh, as his deacon. Yeah. The civil magistrate is God's deacon uh, answering to God for uh, what he does. Uh -huh. And it says what is his, the civil magistrate's marching orders are very plain, reward the righteous and punish the wrongdoer. Yeah. All right, that's what they're assigned to do. And they're God's deacons to do that. Now, uh, some people say, we'll point to Romans 13, and say, and that was written uh, in the 50s when Nero was, uh, you know... Burning the, Christians. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the, the great slime ball of history, Nero was the emperor, and Paul said, submit... Well, Nero's reign had two phases. Yeah. Um, uh, in the early part of his reign, he was actually a decent emperor, largely because... Um, Seneca, the philosopher Seneca, was one of his advisors and I think was around to keep his foot on the brake. <laughs> right? In the later part of uh, and there, it's actually referred to as a goal, like a five year, there's a period of real stable rule. Yeah. Uh, and that's when Romans is written. But you can see in Paul's letters, he's expecting trouble with Rome coming. Yeah. And, uh, and that sure enough, it came about later on in, in Nero's. Um, Reign where he went around the bend. What do you do when the civil magistrate starts punishing the righteous and rewarding the wrongdoer? Yeah. What happens when he photo negative? You know, when it's a photo negative. Yeah. Well, one of the things we do is we interpret scripture with scripture. So um, Paul, the same Paul who wrote Romans thirteen, uh, escaped from King Aretas, lowered from a. Bas lowered from a, si a, a window in the city wall yeah. of Damascus in a basket. In modern parlance, uh, Paul was evading arrest. Yeah. Right. He was running roadblocks. He was not turning himself in. Yeah. Okay. He um, he was arrested multiple times. <laughs> he had judicial. Uh, he was flogged multiple uh, multiple times. He was yeah. stoned. He, so the Apostle Paul was not a gentle, meek, mild, oh, whatever. He didn't go to the mayor's office when he arrived in a town yeah. and said, now tell me where to preach and what to preach and when to preach and I'll be careful not to do anything. <laughs> uh, that wasn't his life at all, yeah. right? And so the man who wrote Romans 13 was executed by the Roman authorities yeah. as a seditious threat. Yeah. <laughs> right? Paul, you hypocrite. Uh, yeah. And I would say he's not a hypocrite at all. He's He is... Um, he is simply. I think Christians ought to be ought not to be scofflaws. Yeah. They ought to drive on the right side of the road. They ought not to poach, uh, poach animals. They ought. They, they should be honest with their taxes. Yeah. As Paul says, taxes do and taxes are due. Yeah. We should be the most. What, what on on the central basics? We should be the most compliant citizens that the government has. Yeah. And then when they come to the line, what they demand we cross everybody should be astonished mm -hmm. that we refuse to cross that line yeah and that's what happened with rome rome said oh okay now all you need is a little pinch of incense to the emperor 
And all the Christians said no. Yeah. Can you give uh, maybe a few recommended reading for people who are, especially in this time of COVID and uh, all sorts of kind of government, we would say maybe tyranny or overreach, what books or resources would you advise someone who wants to dive deeper into, you know, they want to honor God, but they're not sure, like, even what is the proper authority if, yeah, yeah. if the government's doing this or the mayor or the president? Yeah, probably the best, the most helpful, uh, good luck finding it, but the, <laughs> this was written by a Huguenot under the pseudonym of Junius Brutus okay. in the 1500s. It's called Vindicia, Vindicii Contra Tyrannus, or Vindication Against Tyrants. Okay. Uh, and it's an expression of the um, the Huguenots' theology of resistance mm -hmm. against encroaching tyranny. Yeah. Um, and it's a very, it's an outstanding it's just an outstanding um, book. Okay. Um, what if they can't find that one? <laughs> okay, it, it should be um, Canon Press is going to be republishing it. Oh, okay. uh, Within the next years, it's going to be part of our Christian Classics okay. series. Another book that Canon is uh, going to be publishing in the same vein is Samuel Rutherford's Lex Rex. Yeah. So uh, uh, Samuel Rutherford uh, um, wrote that book, The Law is King, mm -hmm. and he's arguing in favor of a constitutional arrangement where the man sitting on the throne is not the final authority on everything. Yeah. It's a, there's a constitutional framework yeah. where there are checks and balances in the system. Right. Um, if you want to... Um, uh, if you want to see how that translated into the formation of the American Republic, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of books. Uh, one would be um, the original name was God and Government by Gary DeMar. Um, Gary DeMar had some good material on on civic um, civics in the American uh, setting, and then Rush Dooney wrote a book called This Independent Republic. Okay. Um, this Independent Republic, uh, God and Government, Gary DeMar. I think it's a. Uh, well, it used to be three volumes. Yeah, now it's one volume. one volume. And um, and then Lex Rex and uh, Vindication Against Tyrants. Okay, that's great. Well, uh, thanks, Pastor Doug, for joining us. If you are uh, sojourning on through the Bible Reading Challenge, enjoy uh, Romans and learn to love it. I would encourage you to keep on reading. <laughs>